Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. We're bringing you another really fascinating guest today who is helping to create a better tomorrow on many different fronts. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Dr. Stephen Johnston, who is director of the Center for Innovations in Medicine, a professor in the School of Life Sciences, and director of the Biologic Design Graduate program at the Biodesign Institute, Arizona State University. Uh, and the Center for Innovations in Medicine uh, basically focuses on innovative solutions to fundamental problems in biomedicine. Uh, their organization brings together really interdisciplinary groups of scientists to identify, uh, analyze, and ultimately come up with really inventive solutions for significant unmet medical needs. Uh, the current uh, translational sciences and technology development occurring uh, under Dr. Johnson's uh, part of you right now include both a program on cancer eradication with the focus of developing universal preventative cancer vaccines, uh, also a topic of health futures, which is ultimately aimed at preventing these unique diagnostic systems that allow monitoring continuously of one's health uh, in healthy, healthy people, ultimately helping to reduce uh, disease, looking at pre-symptomatic uh, possibilities. Uh, Dr. Johnson has broad experience in basic sciences, has been involved in cloning the gal for gene, uh, showing that proteins have uh, separable functional domains, discovering ATPase-associated proteins and their roles in transcription. He's also been the co inventor and inventor of pathogen-derived resistance, organelle transformation, the gene gun, genetic immunization, tobacco etch virus protease system, expression library immunization, linear expression elements, sin bodies, and a really interesting topic that we'll be getting into immunosignaturing. Uh, Dr. Johnson is author of over 150 journal articles, has over 20 patents, and has raised uh, over uh, close to about $100 million in grant support from organizations like DARPA, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and the National National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute of the NIH. Uh, Dr. Johnson, he, uh, he has this bachelor's degree in molecular biology, University of Wisconsin-Madison, his PhD in genetics uh, and plant genetics, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and did his postdoc in biochemistry uh, out here at Penn State Medical Center. We're honored to have him. A lot of exciting things to talk about. Dr. Stephen Johnson, thanks so much for taking the time to come on our show. Sure, glad to do it. Uh, one addendum to that, though, way too much information, but um, is that most of my time right now is spent uh, as a founding CEO of Calvary, this company to try and uh, commercialize early detection and preventative vaccines for cancer. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, I, I meant to throw that one on there. I, I do have Calvary on the list here. So that, but thank you for bringing that up. I, 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 I did neglect to, to mention that, but it really, it really um, is a fascinating bio, Stephen. And I, and I sort of wanted to highlight at the beginning and sort of um, you, you are clearly someone that, uh, you know, I use the word convergent a lot on these shows in the sense that, you know, you, you bring together the human biosciences, the whole world of agricultural biotech. We'll get a little into what goes on at uh, the Biodesign Institute, but let's say just a few words, if you were, for about a minute or so on sort of, uh, you know, how you develop these interests, because, you know, it is really a broad ranging suite of things. Talk a little bit about the beginning, what got you interested in, in this area, if you would. So, you know, I was a basic researcher, but I, I got uh, probably influenced by being at the University of Wisconsin, uh, 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 sort of the inventor bug. And so uh, I started at this initially with John Sanford, uh, just started thinking about things we could invent and uh, in the biomedical area. Uh, and, and for no real purpose other than, is it, wouldn't it be cool if you could do this? Uh, 
And, uh, and that's been my theme since then. And, you know, speaking now about the Biodesign Institute for a minute at, at Arizona State, you, know, you have the, this mission of delivering the future of nature-inspired scientific innovation uh, for the betterment of human health, community safety, and global sustainability. And, and the organization sort of has this tagline, taking cues from nature, which I love. And uh, you know, people that maybe have followed over the years have seen sort of the, the ZMAP Ebola antibodies produced in tobacco by, by Charlie Arnson's group and work in the microbiome. Uh, I, I mentioned before the show, I, I spent some time with George Post uh, talking about uh, some, of, some of the similar themes of the complex uh, adaptive the systems work there at ASU. Talk a little bit about the mission, if you would, because it is very unique uh, compared to a lot of the other sort of uh, institutions around this country where there's a lot of things kept in silos. You guys really uh, think interdisciplinary. Say a few words about that, if you would. Yeah, the, Charles Larson was the initial um, organizer for the Biodesign Institute, and then George Post uh, took over the range from him and really defined it as uh, this, uh, um, the flagship for science at Arizona State University. This was going to be a, a place uh, built around centers who were highly interactive and very uh, focused on translational research. Um, and based on that vision that was supported by Mike Crow, who's still the president of ASU, uh, they recruited me over to a Arizona State University, which I only thought of as a party school. So, but, they gave me a lot of money and I came over and started working on some visions of inventions that I had uh, along the way that they gave me enough money that I could start exploring that. And George Post was very supportive, even though there were a lot of people that thought that these ideas were, wouldn't work or were not very smart. Uh, George still gave me the range to go spend the money any way I wanted, and, and that was great for me. And he did that for other people at Biodesign. Um, frankly, it became difficult to really drive such a vision within the context of a university. Uh, it was pretty constraining, and that's why I decided to go off and start a company rather than uh, continue with um, the work in the Biodesign. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, before we get to um, eradicating cancer and universal cancer vaccines and everything you're doing at Calvary, I, I wanted to uh, take a brief stop at, at another fascinating area that you've focused on over the years. And we actually had uh, a partner uh, of the organization um, in, in uh, Dr. Eric Van Giesen uh, last year from DARPA. Uh, on a show where he was talking about the the echo program the epigenetic characterization observation program and uh you know this of, of course feeds into sort of this domain that you've uh, been very instrumental in known as immunosignaturing which is basically this fascinating tool of looking at uh the immune system uh, really the details of sort of epigenetics and so forth uh not just for understanding immune diseases but basically understanding many diseases and a lot of the the very early changes that occur early on in our bodies uh, long before disease ever manifests. Can you take a little time, as I spent a little time on the ECHO program, but can you talk a little broader about um, sort of the history of your work in immunosignaturing? We'll talk about how it feeds into cancer work in a moment, but talk a little bit about the, the genesis of this. Because I said, we heard one side from the DARPA folks. I want you to tell a little bit about the story because I think it's very instrumental to everything you're doing now. Yeah, that actually it does, that, that concept of being able to read out in an unbiased way, the immune system. That's basically the fundamental concept. Uh, interestingly, that started because of DARPA. DARPA posed a challenge that said, if there were another biological event, uh, whether it was natural or, or not, uh, how could we detect that? And uh, no matter what it was, how could we pick that up in a population so we could respond to it quickly? So they posed that question generally to myself and a lot of other people. And the solution that I came up with it was pretty, I, I think, good. And that is that one, you wanted to be able to read people's immune system. I, I was convinced that the immune system is basically a sensor system of everything that's going on in your body at any time. And that was there a simple way we could read out the immune system uh, for on people's health 
so we could get the earliest signals in a population that something untoward was happening. And that's where I came up with this idea of, of immunosignatures. But I also had another specification. We, you can't, I, we learned within the biodefense industry with um, uh, BioWatch that you can't sustain a system like that just because you're going to detect an event that may or may not ever happen. It's unsustainable. So what you had to have is a system that everyone would do because they were self-interested. And oh, by the way, you would pick up a, a biological attack or a new outbreak like COVID. Um, so that the way I, I figured this out was, that, okay, well, let's have an unbiased way to tell what the profiles of your antibodies are from a very small amount of blood. And so that's where I came up with this idea that if you had a chip that had uh, a lot of chemical diversity on it, so that the antibodies would bind in a true signature way, mm -hmm. we could read out what the profile of your immune system was at any moment in time, and also look at the delta. Was there any change in over time in that immune profile? And is, are, is that change happening in concert with other people in your community? Well, well, there's probably an outbreak of something. And so that was the idea I sold DARPA on. Uh, they gave me quite a bit of money to um, work out the technology. The big challenge was what we decided to do, the best chemical surface were peptides. Mm -hmm. And so peptides that were chosen from random sequence space to generate a uh, chemical diversity surface. And, and so that was the big idea to, to use random sequence space, not specific life space peptides. Mm -hmm. And then the other idea was, okay, how do you get these antibodies to bind if these are low affinity peptides? And it turns out that if you put those peptides within one, three nanometers of each other, you will bind those antibodies by avidity, sort of like getting them caught in a kelp bed. And, and that was a big technological breakthrough. And then we had to figure out how do, you, how do you make hundreds of thousands of these peptides on a small chip? And that was where we had to go to Intel and find out how do they process wafers, but then marry that to Bach chemistry, peptide synthesis chemistry. And that took me about 10 years to figure out how to do that. It wasn't simple. Uh, it looks very simple on paper, but it, it wasn't simple to do technologically. <laughs> but once you marry those two things and you can, you can use an Intel process to make chips cheaply, and all you need is a drop of blood to put it on there to read out your immune system, now you could envision monitoring people's health on a regular basis because they're interested in cancer or interested in heart disease, not because they're interested in a bio threat event. And the, but we would be able to pick those up. And that was the source of, so DARPA was the source of me wanting to come up with this idea. No, it's a, it's a uh, it's a, it was a fascinating story when I listened to it last, well, it was a year and a half ago, it was sort of in the middle of COVID, uh, but to sort of see now the, the, the further connections and everything you're doing. And that's, I, I appreciate you giving that background again, because I, it, I think it segues ways really nicely into um, to, to, to the big stuff you're working on now. But um, so, you know, one of the things we, you know, we, we've talked about a lot on the show, right, that I come out of the pharmaceutical industry and thinking back, you know, 20 some odd years when the blockbusters of, of, of the industry were the, the Lipitors and the Viagras and all the other small molecule drugs. Now you look at that list, you see a, a slew of so-called immuno-oncology products, primarily the monoclonal antibodies, but immuno-oncology is extremely hot. You got the monoclonals, you have the CAR-Ts uh, coming online. Uh, but what you're doing is sort of really the next phase of this. And I think it was in 2014, you asked the question uh, in expert review of vaccines, could immunosignature technologies enable the development of preventive cancer vaccines? Uh, and then there was the recent uh, paper, RNA transcription and splicing errors as a source of cancer frame shift neoantigens for these vaccines. You've taken, you know, once again, you've married this unique 
immunosignaturing technology now to look for uh, sort of not the mutations that uh, you know may be out there for these cancers, but are, are very unique. We, we learned about a lot about cancer over the years that uh, not all these cancers are the same. We might have many different mutations that yield the same type of cancer, but looking at these really unique profiles of these RNAs and these uh, these these protein changes uh, that these tools like the immunosignaturing would be beautiful at uh, not just understanding, but then creating some unique therapeutics in the terms of these vaccines to look at multiple targets simultaneously that could serve as sort of these universal uh, vaccine strategies. Take us a little bit into how you came up with this idea about the uh, the RNA frame shift mutations and, and a little bit of you know what's transpired the last couple of years. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the, the dog study after that, but Take us to the okay. beginning, if you want. Yeah. Okay. Now, am, am, am I being too technical? Or? No, no, no. You, you, you're spot on. It's perfect. Everything okay. you've been Okay. So, um, so after, you know, John and I worked on, we actually invented nucleic acid vaccines back in 1922. And, and we worked on that for quite a while. But then it, it, it looked like it was in, in the hands of people that were smarter than us. So we thought we could go off and do something else. And so what I thought of was to look at cancer because at that point there no checkpoint this was in 2004 no checkpoint inhibitors no progress in cancer really um and and it it, it looked pretty dismal and so i thought as an inventor that's one of the criteria you look at it where's an area where nobody's made any progress so that that's easy because it's really really hard yeah. Or it's because they weren't imaginative enough. And so I made the second assumption. And so what we did is um, we started, I usually started with an invention of making a list of specifications, what I want this invention to do. And one is that I wanted it to be a, a simple system to prevent people from getting cancer in the first place, you know, because that was the ideal thing, right? Absolutely. And to treat it, cancer like an infectious disease. And so to do that, we had to find some way to immunize people uh, that would anticipate the tumor. Now we knew that tumors were mutagenic and stuff like this at that point. Um, the, the, they were just sequenced, finishing the sequencing of the human genome. And so, but we had to find something that was shared between people because if you're going to make this something that's going to prevent it, it has to be shared by everybody. Yeah. And you also, it had to be, in my mind, one of my specifications was that it had to be something that's inexpensive because if you're going to, 70% of the cancer doesn't occur in the developed countries. It occurs in, in the developing countries and they're never going to afford, back then it was GVAC, they're never going to afford these highly expensive drugs and the ones that you cited now, the immune checkpoint inhibitors and CAR T, we're talking things that are hundreds of thousands of dollars of treatment uh, for each individual. There's no way you're going to use that in Africa uh, to prevent cancer and so, or treat cancer. So that was one of our specifications that we've kept true to. And I think we're unique in that regard. Most people in the cancer field don't say, hey, our technology has to address cancer all over the world. Um, so we started looking around at that. And this is, I mean, if there's students that listen to this, uh, in the textbooks, it said that you can't, it's actually in the textbooks in immunology that you can't make a preventative cancer vaccine. And they cited these experiments that people had done 30 years ago in mice to show that you, a vaccine of a tumor will only protect against that tumor. It won't protect against any other tumor. And we saw a, a flaw in that logic of those experiments and we decided to go test it. And so we did, we found that um, <clears throat> we looked at a, a tumor in mouse and we sequenced the cDNA and we said, hey, here's some of the mutations in the cDNA. Now we'll go look and see if they are also in a def This was in melanoma, let's go look at breast cancer. What do you know? What if, some of those are shared every once in a while, there's ones that's shared between them. And so what if you vaccinate with the ones that are shared, will you protect against both tumors? And indeed you did. So that was the big breakthrough. It says that the text books were wrong. You can make a vaccine that will protect against different tumors. 
um, it, 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 for this um, same vaccine. And we were off and running. I did that work physically back in those days. I did that with my own hands, with my postdoc, and, and we, it was so beautiful. But we also, the DNA sequencing was coming out then and showing that tumors were unique. Every tumor was unique at the DNA level in terms of the mutations. And so we, we decided, well, wait a minute. In, if you think about information flow, as information flows, it gets more and more error prone. And so we looked at, we decided to look at the RNA, not the DNA. And that was the other big breakthrough that we, when we looked at the RNA, we found that there's a hundred times more errors that tumors are making at the RNA level than at the DNA level. And indeed they're shared. And so, uh, you know, the 10% of the people with breast cancer will make this mutation and, and, and so will 10%, 10 uh, 10% of the people will make the same mutation. And so at the RNA level, technically they're not mutations, they're variants, uh, cause they're not heritable. Um, so we were off and running on that and we thought this is great. Well, and we also realized if at that point there'd been about 30 years of cancer vaccine history, and it was a dismal failure. They actually did a meta study and showed that there were no differences between controls and people getting the vaccines uh, over 30 years of vaccination. And so, and but almost all of those studies were doing, one, they're late, treating late stage, and two, they all use self-antigens. And I didn't know much about immunology. I actually flunked immunology for my PhD. Um, that, but I read a Scientific American article and, it, and self antigens are not good antigens because you, your immune system is trained not to see them as self antigens, otherwise you'll have autoimmune disease. So with that simplistic notion, we said we have to have uh, things that are foreign. And the most foreign thing that you could make is a frame shift where the, the reading frame goes off and it starts making a piece of junk protein. And those would be, our reasoning was that those would be the most immunogenic. So we focused on finding RNA errors that produce frame shifts, and that's going to make us make a vaccine to prevent cancer. And we were the only ones working on this. Nobody, including biodesign people, when I started working out there, nobody supported this idea. They all thought they let me do it, but they all thought I was crazy, um, that it would never work. I do have... In 2012, there was a Nature editorial, and it said, you know, um, misguided cancer goal. And it was this idea that to create a preventative vac vaccine was not only couldn't you do it, but we should even suggest that we stop the research because we were raising false hopes. Mm -hmm. So I, ha I think I'm the only person that's had an editorial in Nature that says that they should stop their research. Um, <laughs> It's that editorial's on my door, my office, by the way. Um, so, but we kept working on it. Um, and so, you know, the funny thing, we, oh, there was a, back to the immune signature part of this, yes. it, it was technically, in order to affect this, it was really hard to read out RNA, to do it on, because we would have to do it in hundreds of people and find out what they have in common technologically, especially back then, that was a big challenge. So, but we made a discovery, it was really interesting. As almost as soon as the tumor starts forming, it engages the immune system. Your immune system knows you have a tumor very, very early on. D cells are seeing what's weird about that tumor and they're starting to make antibodies to the weird parts of the protein, including these frame shifts. And that was a big discovery because now we know we had some way to read out what a tumors are doing early on. And so that we had, that's where we developed these chips. And unfortunately, I'm not in my office. I can't show you the wafer, but we developed the, in, married the Intel process with the peptide process. So now to tell what a patient has a cancer, in order to tell what they're frame shifts they're making, all we have to do is take a drop of blood from that person and put them on one of those chips and we can tell what frame shifts the tumor is making. So that really facilitated figuring out how to make a uh, 
preventative cancer vaccine. And you've you've created and and what 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 can you tell us at this point? I, mean, I think I read something like you, there's I think there's a, a couple dozen different uh, frame shift uh, target let's say targets that that sort of the uh, the vaccine moiety or moiety because it's a combination uh, sort of a cocktail of sorts. Um, can you tell us anything about sort of the 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 moiety that you're studying per se, and then if you could take us a little into the vaccine against canine cancer study, which I believe uh, you enrolled up is 800 dogs or so, um, went on for about two years. Talk us a little bit about what you found. I mean, I know Calvary was involved in that, uh, also some uh, external uh, philanthropy sources to fund it. Um, talk us a little bit where that has gone as well, if you can. Sure, sure. So we, we wanted to basically make a preventative cancer vaccine. So we use, and we now had the tools to do it, you know, with these chips. Yeah. And so we, the basic idea is that we'll take people with breast cancer, lung cancer, find out what they have in common, make a yep. vaccine and da, da, da. No one was interested on the human side of doing that. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we, we couldn't get any support for it. So we went to the, and submitted grants to DOD, NIH, everything, all rejected. Um, and then, so we, um, I talked to some guy, who, a venture capitalist who just said, well, have you ever thought of working in dogs? And, which I hadn't. And I contacted a, a, a notable person in dog oncology, Doug Tham at mm -hmm. Colorado State University. And he said, oh, it sounds like an interesting idea. It probably won't work, but let's try it. <laughs> and a total different <laughs> attitude than I got from the human community. And so, um, so we started putting together a proposal to do this study in dogs, which and what was important, and I had to learn all this. I didn't know this. Dogs get cancer at the same rate as people. Uh, and they get a lot of the cancer, 30 to 40% lifetime risk for cancer. And a lot of the cancers that they get are very similar to people. The breast cancer in dog looks basically the same as breast cancer in people. Uh, they get other cancers too that are unusual, but there, there's a lot of analogy. The only thing difference is basically the whole process is sped up about five or seven fold. The tumor just grows five or seven fold faster in a dog than it does in a person. Mm. So you get a, you could do a clinical trial faster. So we started trying to find out if we could get support for doing a clinical trial in dogs, always rejected, but then somehow uh, a foundation, Open Philanthropy, mm -hmm. heard we were trying to do this and came to us and said, we're looking for crazy stuff that somebody's trying to do <laughs> in biology that we'd like to fund. And, and I guess we were crazy enough. So they gave us the money to run this clinical trial. So to design the vaccine, we just uh, collected samples from 800 dogs with cancer, eight different cancers, and we screened them on our chips. And we said, what do you know? What do they have in common of reactivity to frame shifts? And we found 131 frame shifts that mm. these dogs had in common again across these eight cancers. And we took 31 of those and put them into a vaccine. And we started this trial. We started enrolling 800 dogs, which were about half, uh, 800 dogs in this trial. We screened them first to see if they have cancer, at least by standard screening techniques. And then if they don't have cancer, then we give them the vaccine and keep monitoring them on their way out, both for safety, because there was a concern that we'd cause autoimmunity with these vaccines. Mm. And more importantly, do we reduce the incidence of any cancer? in these dogs. So uh, we're almost to the third year. The third year is May. In the end of the second year, they did a thorough safety examination and there's no safety issues with the uh, vaccine in dogs, which is important. And then the uh, one time I gave a talk about this idea and somebody came up afterwards and said, have you seen the movie, I'm the legend? And I said, <laughs> no. And so I went back to my hotel room and saw that I said, 
boy, I don't hope it doesn't turn out that way. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this, but yeah. somebody invented a vaccine to, to prevent cancer and kill the whole world. Yeah, but they, um, use, they use measles in that. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I said, we're never going to touch a measles right, right, right. component of our vaccine. <laughs> and so, um, but the, um, but we started, uh, so the first efficacy evaluation will come up in May. Um, in, in terms of are we preventing cancers in general? Are we preventing any specific types of cancers? Um, you know, to see if there's any hint that the vaccine might be efficacious. Uh, I can say that personally in my company, we're confident enough that um, about the results and general stuff we're doing, we're, we, are very sure you can make a preventative cancer vaccine. And we're going to start, we've started making the commercial product for the dogs. And this year we will start on de developing the commercial product for humans for a preventative cancer vaccine, starting with breast cancer. So the, the I irony is that I've begun to realize, Ira, is that the thing that everybody thought was going to be so hard to do, mm -hmm. make a preventative cancer vaccine, was actually the simplest thing to do. It was so much simpler than everybody thought it was going to be. Um, every, the cancer community will be embarrassed, I think, by not trying to do this earlier. I think, um, I think one of the interesting things about it, as you talk about that angle, you know, you know, uh, the, the, the industry, I mean, I, I've been in it and I've sort of also been in some sort of tangential areas where, you know, if, if, there are some of the, the weirder projects out there, but, um, you know, the, the industry has always has taught the, the people inside to think in terms of, you know, there's this one drug substance or this one antibody or this one antigen or what have you, and, and sort of what you're doing, which obviously is extremely elegant and makes sense, where you're, but you're taking this cocktail and, you know, Cocktails make a lot of sense, right? Especially if uh, if we're talking mm -hmm. about the unique nature of uh, of, of these uh, different mutations and the fact you're not going to have a single magic bullet like the industry likes. I think it's very elegant. I think that's one of the. Uh, I think we're overcoming that because we're seeing obviously things like this, things like uh, you know some of the microbiome products that are being developed, where you know it's not a drug, right? It's a commission of different microbes yeah, yeah. and things like that. So I think you're in a very uh, interesting area in domain. Obviously, you got to fight to get to make these people understand. Yeah, a drug can look uh, not like a pure white powder, but it can look different than uh, a traditional drug or uh, therapeutic protein or what have you is concerned. So that's exciting. Um, oh, thanks. What um, can you just say a few words more about Calviri? Um, private company. Uh, how much money has it raised? Are you looking to raise money now? Well, what's, what's the status of the company? And sort of as, as you have this dog study going on, what else about the company can you talk about? Yeah, so we, we started purely as a company to develop a preventative cancer vaccine. And, uh, but as, as luck would have it, when you develop a platform, it also often has applications that you didn't envision. Yeah. And it turned out that those chips were, that we were screening the blood samples on mm -hmm. turned out to be the best way to detect cancer early. Uh, as you know, that there's a lot of interest now in early detection of cancer, mm -hmm. and rightly so, because even with standard of care, early detection now leads to uh, survival, much longer survival and often cures. Mm -hmm. But you have to get it at stage one if you're going to see that. Um, there, a lot of companies out there are trying to do that, like Grail, um, Garden, Exact, um, but they've run into a wall. They're, all of their technologies are based on detecting nucleic acids that the tumor sheds into okay. the blood. Turns out that that's fine at late stage, but at early stage, many tumors shed very little blood or DNA into the blood. So their difficulty they're having is sensitivity. They get very good, they know when they say you have a tumor, you have a tumor. But in some tumors, they're only right 20% of the time, that they only pick it up 20% of the time. So that's the real problem with sensitivity. And that's where these chips turned out to look like they have a lot of value. 
because they're not looking at, for nucleic acids. They're looking for the B cells having seen that tumor or not. If the B cell sees the tumor, it will start amplifying the antibodies and we can pick it up on the chip. So it turns out that the, these chips are great for this high sensitivity for picking up tumors, both in dogs and in people. So that turns out to be a, 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 an interesting project, uh, a product for us also in parallel. And you mentioned checkpoint inhibitors. Yep. Um, they are the big revolution. They're the, by far the biggest revolution in cancer that's occurred probably for a long time since so the discovery of radiation, maybe even. Um, but they have liabilities. They, one, they only work in 20 to 30% of the people. Some tumors, they don't work at all. Um, when they do work, they often have side effects. There's a, adverse uh, immune events in, in a fair number of the people and up to 50% of the people have severe adverse events. Mm -hmm. And the cost, they now are costing about $150,000 a course of, of treatment. Yep. Um, so that's very expensive for uh, treatment. So there's a lot of emphasis out there on trying to find out, can you predict whether someone will respond to this very expensive therapy or not? And could you possibly predict who's gonna have an adverse event so we can be keyed up to take care of them first? Um, <laughs> Just by accident, in collaboration with MD Anderson, we've discovered that these chips are very good at predicting who will respond or not respond before treatment um, to therapy. Hmm. So apparently, the whether your profile of reactivity with certain frame shifts is this or that determines whether you're going to respond to a subsequent treatment, hmm. which is really interesting from a biological point of view. That it's it's almost as if your immune system is set up already. A, it has a set point. And that set point determines what you're going to, whether you, what kind of response you're going to have to this disturbance of your, your immune system, in this case, a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, so we have, that'll probably be our first human product, will be mm. the checkpoint inhibitor predictor. So those are the three products that our company's pushing forward. We're a startup. Yep. Um, we're, we've got about $18 million in funding, but almost all of that came from our board of directors and their close associates. It's privately, all privately funded to date, except for uh, we received about six and a half million dollars from uh, Open Philanthropy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's non-dilutive funding just to run that trial. Um, so, but we'll be going out, we've met a bunch of milestones. We'll be going out for major funding uh, this year. Uh, to really take on a lot more human clinical trials. Excellent. Really excellent. I, 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 love, hearing, <laughs> I love hearing stories like this come together in that context. So no, it's, it's, uh, that, that's extremely exciting. Um, Stephen, I, I want to, um, you, you know, we, we've gone from sort of the, the broad uh, tech platforms, uh, going through biodefense into cancer. I want to go one other place because I, um, you know, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, you have a couple hundred uh, peer-reviewed papers, uh, and, and the, I always, I always pick out one that is sort of a little off the beaten path from the core subject, but this one hit me in the face, and I, I'd love to talk about it for a couple minutes. Um, in 2004, uh, you published in the Archives of Neurobiology a paper uh, entitled Genetic Vaccination to Bias the Immune Response to Amyloid Beta Peptide uh, as a Therapy in Alzheimer's <laughs> Disease. Um, now, uh, obviously, cancer kills more people, but I've done a lot of shows on Alzheimer's, and, and this is a, a, a tsunami that's coming <laughs> that we yeah. ain't prepared for. Uh, and my former employers are doing very bad at creating drugs for this disease yeah uh, talk, you know you know you a lot about you hear about okay we, we developed this antibody for beta amyloid oh it, it does okay but then there's inflammation and that goes. it seems to me uh, i hear a lot about sort of a greater understanding of alzheimer's uh, you know as having these multiple mechanisms yes there's amyloid but there's also this inflammation uh there is potentially a sort of an endocrine component people calling it type 3 diabetes a lot of pieces to the puzzle and then you know is the is the amyloid soluble is it not soluble and all these angles it seems to me i'm not a <laughs> not a neurobiologist but 
some of the angle that you're taking on this and sort of looking at these diseases quite broadly about everything that's going on could yield something kind of interesting. And I'd like to, obviously, you, you didn't take the company towards Alzheimer's initially, but talk a little about what you see potentially, whether it's for the signaturing or potential vaccination tools uh, in this extremely unmet medical need. So, the, yeah, so you picked that and you went, had to go way back. Um, I like so, that. Um, yeah, we were, when, when we invented gene vaccines, the initial emphasis was to use those for infectious disease, right. obviously. But we, I, I got the idea that maybe that's too limiting, that we could start vaccinating against other things like chronic diseases. And yeah. the first one I was interested in was, was, wasn't cancer, it was actually Alzheimer's. And um, because it's a terrible disease, as you know, it's, you know, as it, is, is, is a nasty a disease as cancer in, in many ways. And, 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 and also because of the impact on other people, you know, the people, uh, friends and family. So we, I thought that maybe you could make a gene vaccine against Alzheimer's just by um, directing antibodies towards uh, a beta. And we went pretty far with that one. We actually went into monkeys and did a monkey trial and tried it. And I was fairly convinced. And we also knew we had started to develop the immunosignatures. We, we saw that there was a, a distinct immune response, uh, a diagnostic response of people with Alzheimer's. Uh, mm -hmm. We ran some blood from the, the Colombian community, the Priestinillin group of people in Colombia that that genetically get the Alzheimer's. Um, so I became fairly convinced that, and we did mouse models, and clearly you could prevent Alzheimer's in mice and you could uh, partially cure it with vaccines. Um, that was there. And then and we were well on our way with that, thinking that we'd develop it. And then that Elan study came out in um, where, I don't know if you recall this, but uh, Elan was an Irish company did the mouse study, remarkable story. They did these yeah. mouse studies with uh, vaccinating against uh, 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 a beta and it looked promising in mice. They went right into people, into a phase one. The phase one looked safe and there was indication of efficacy. And then they did a large phase two and this is where they killed 12 people uh, from encephalitis. And, the, and, you know, we actually predicted this was the wrong vaccine that they were using. They were using it with the wrong adjuvant. They were using the wrong part of the of beta. And, and so the, I, I think the trial actually had some positive effects, but they, it was covered up by the, the dire side effects. And so everybody jumped, jumped ship on the vaccine. Nobody was interested in funding that or, or uh, pursuing the vaccine anymore. I think some pe the people are coming back to it. Mm -hmm. I actually am fairly convinced that you can make a vaccine for preventing Alzheimer's, but I don't think it's going to be to a, probably the best idea is back to your gamish idea the, or mixtures. It will be both a beta and tau at least mm -hmm. uh, in the vaccine. And there may be two kinds of Alzheimer's. There may be people that's largely driven by A beta. There may be people that it's living largely by tau or, or even other components. And I think we'll, we'll have to just take, and there's no reason not to include all of them into the vaccine. Um, and so I think that if I, we, we expect, we think that we will be successful in developing a vaccine to prevent cancer. Mm -hmm. And as we're more going along, we're more and more sure of that, we're going to develop other approaches to other chronic diseases and Alzheimer's next on our list. So we will go back to Alzheimer's and, and see what we can do. If we can, and unless somebody's invented the solution already uh, to see if we could, somebody's got to try and solve it uh, one way or the other. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I say, I definitely think you, you're, you're on a, the correct path here. Um, clearly. Uh, and yeah, you know, maybe it's it's a matter of the fact that you know it it you need these different tools in hand, as you have say. You know, now you not just have the vaccines, but you have the tools to really understand uh, the very unique biology that's going on in all these diseases. You know, where it's not 
I'm going yeah. back. It's not. It's not a silver magic bullet. Uh, th- there's a lot of biology is complex, and if yeah. you have these tools, uh, you're able to whether it's the immune signaturing or other things you develop, um, really give you a better understanding on on how to, you know, how you create therapeutics, pharmacotherapeutics, whatever to uh, to yeah. deal with the the unique nature. Um, yeah, no. I think we've, you know, uh, if there's a theme that we've had is that we've tried to take develop platforms to give us a completely unbiased yep. search to, to look at the problem and then to assume that there's a simple solution. Yeah. You know, in biology, they, people tend to think that everything's complicated. Yeah. And, and, you know, what I teach my students is say, if you want to do something effective in biology, forget the bio part. <laughs> Just look at the logic part. Just yeah. focus on the logic first and then worry about the bio later. Um, I, I, I find biologists tend to try to mobilize all they know into what the solution is and it makes it very complicated right from the beginning. Mm-hmm. How many times have you ter- heard the saying, cancer is complex? Yeah. Camp- yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. We need to study it more. We need more money. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> and, it's a, and I think that's true. But you can also say, is there a simple solution to this problem? And and that's why I think if, if we happen to be right about this cancer vaccine as a preventative vaccine, it is a simple solution. And people should and, be... And a logical one. <laughs> yeah, a logical one. Yeah. Um, Steve, while I have you, um, anything else that you want to profile that I've missed? Uh, anything for 2022 conferences you're going to be presenting at? Uh, other initiatives that you want to mention uh, while I have you on the show? Well, now that we've started to meet all these milestones that we set out for ourselves, we'll be going to vaccine conferences and diagnostics and immunotherapeutic conferences. I've, I've scheduled for those. And um, so I think we're on a roll to really get this preventative vaccine uh, concept going. Our biggest challenge now will be how to conduct the clinical trial. Yeah. And that may, that may demand more inventiveness than coming up with the vaccine in the first place. Um, Because there's really nothing like that in in the cancer field, the biggest similarities in the infectious disease field. Mm -hmm. And so that will be a challenge and we're grappling with that and talking to people how how to conduct this trial. Um, But we do have another technology. I thought thought if you were gonna hit on something, it'd be another invention we have called SynBodies. And and I, I'm just, you know, maybe I don't get it, but this is such a simple, elegant idea for making therapeutic antibodies that um, I'm surprised that no one's following through on it. Uh, we just don't have the bandwidth. But as you know, 70% of the drugs that are coming down the pipeline now are antibodies or derivative yeah. antibodies. Yet what makes the part of the reason that immunotherapeutics, like checkpoint inhibitors, those are antibodies, yet they're costing $100,000, $150,000. What if you could simply, if you could get a Lego block type of system to make an antibody to anything you want that's synthetic? Hmm. And that's what I thought we invented. It looked pretty good. and um, so that that is one I'm I'm trying to push somebody else to go off and take advantage of that as a technology for starting a company because I think it's such a powerful it's again it's extremely simple such a powerful technology that's that's a sleeper I think um, but we'll, we'll see I uh, I have faith that that. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully someone listening to the show will, uh, will, yeah. will, will reach out and give you a shout at that one. Because, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a fascinating portfolio. Um, yeah, take and, a look at, I, I think you might get a kick out of it. Take a look at the, it's published, we published a lot of it, and the, it's patented and everything. But take a look at the basic concept. The okay. biophysics is so simple. It's it's really cool. Is, is it part of the Calvary portfolio or? No, no, no it's, it's a different. I developed it while I was at the, uh, Biodesign Institute, and so gotcha. hey, it's the gotcha. IP for it. Okay, wonderful. Now we'll, we'll we'll put links to all this. I just want to make sure yeah. that. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, Steve, I'm I'm wishing you the best with all this because it is a um, a fascinating journey you've been on. I, I love the convergent themes. I love I love the sort of the the, 
the combinatorial themes behind the what you're designing and I, you know, I'm going to be watching and, and, and rooting you on as you continue to do this um, for everybody and we will put links in the bio of the show but for everybody uh, that's going to be listening on the podcast networks or watching uh, on the YouTube channel you've been listening to Dr. Stephen Johnston Director, Center for Innovations in Medicine, Professor, School of Life Sciences, Director, Biologic Design Graduate Program, Biodesign Institute, Arizona State University. Um, Steve, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to come talk and educate us for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there uh, for all of us. And as we say on this show, um, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow through your inventions. Uh, really great stories. Thanks. Thanks, Ira, for having me. It's great to talk to you. Yeah, be well.